Our next, our next speaker is Yang Amat Mulia, Tunku Zain Al Abidin, Ibni Tuanku Muhriz. Tunku Abidin is a regular commentator on Malaysian current affairs with columns in the Malay Mail, the Borneo Post and Oriental Daily. He is a trustee of Yayasan Chaukit, Yayasan Munara, the Jeffrey Chia Foundation and the Genovasi Foundation. Please join me in welcoming Tunku Abidin onto the stage to deliver his welcoming address. Thank you, Ira. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, uh, professors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and particularly our guests from around the world. I look forward to the discourse over the next two days being hosted here at the Institute for Advanced Islamic Studies, which has long played an important role uh, in highlighting the variety of discourse within the Muslim world. This is especially helpful given IAIS historic links with the government of Malaysia and continuing chairmanship of former Prime Minister Tun Abdullah Badawi. I'm also grateful to the Center for International Private Enterprise and the Atlas Network for coming on board as lead sponsor and co-sponsor respectively. And I am of course delighted that the Istanbul Network for Liberty has decided to place this conference in Malaysia, enabling the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs ideas to also be a co-sponsor. Central to our mission is the advancement of democratic values in Malaysia, particularly those we feel were articulated at the foundation of our country, but have since been forgotten. Similarly, as we discuss democratic transitions in the Muslim world and the various theological and intellectual justifications and geopolitical realities, it is worth also remembering the experiences from the rich history of our vast geographical space. Many Muslims today, myself included, are motivated by the glory of the Islamic Golden Age. Unfortunately for some, this means the subjugation of others by force. For me, and I hope many in this room, this means creating the conditions that will lead to the flowering of thinkers and philosophers, scientists and innovators, and writers and poets that so characterized that golden age. What are the policies and models of governance that Muslim countries could pursue to achieve this? I can see from the agenda that much time has been allotted to exploring precisely this topic. But permit me to share some interesting tidbits from Malaysia's own history. I hope that this will be a benefit not only to the non-Malaysians in the audience, but also provoke and stimulate the Malaysians as well. For while many refer to incidents from the Middle East, Andalusia, the Ottoman Empire, and even the Mughal Empire for inspiration, Southeast Asia is less often cited. Now, no doubt, in Malaysia's history, there were many features of the pre-modern polities, or kerajaan, which were autocratic, where slavery, debt bondage, and punishments universally deemed barbaric by today's standards were meted out. Having said that, I believe we can find the roots of a democratic society that we continue to aspire to as well. Roots situated within a cultural and religious context that is truly indigenous to our region, thus helping us avoid today's predictable but provocative accusations of neo-colonialism. And the first that I wish to highlight is a 14th century text that has survived hinting at the notions of a social contract, rule of law, and limits to ruler's authority. It is called in Malay, the Batu Basurat Tringanu, or in English, the Tringanu inscription stone, dated by Said Muhammad Najib Al Atas to 1303. If you conduct cursory research about the stone, you will see that most commentators consider its importance in confirming the practice of Islam in the Malay Peninsula at the time. But to me, it is also significant because because it seems to place conditions on the authority of the ruler. One panel of the stone establishes that, and I quote, to decide on the right knowledge is statutory upon all the Muslim king mandalikas in accordance with the decrees of the supreme God who speaks the truth, close quote. A reading of another panel on the stone suggests that, quote, my son or my playmate or my grandchildren or my family and whosoever ignores its contents shall be damned by the supreme God, cursed by the supreme God, end quote. In other words, failure to obey this edict will result in punishment from a higher authority, even if you are a member of the ruling class. Now, we do not know the circumstances surrounding why the ruler referred to as Sri Paduka Tuhan issued this edict. One could speculate that it was either an attempt to solidify his authority, citing his responsibility to the divine. But one could also speculate that 
as the barons at Ranimi did a century earlier, it was written to break an impasse between the ruler and his nobles. If so, this inscription stone could be said to be a Malay Magna Carta that formalized limits to a previously absolutist ruler. A clearer, less speculative reference to a contract is made in one of the classic Malay texts, the 15th and 16th century Malay Annals, or Sejarah Melayu, still referred to in uh, government school history textbooks. And here, there is a story that demonstrates the concept of a social contract in a way that Jean-Jacques Rousseau would have understood. According to John Layden's translation, the king, Sang Sapurba, wants to marry the daughter of a chief, Demang Laba Dawan, and the latter sets conditions on Sang Sapurba marrying his daughter. And I quote, all the family would submit themselves to him who should engage both for himself and posterity that they should receive a liberal treatment and in particular that when they committed faults they should never be exposed to shame nor opprobrious language but if their faults were great that they should be put to death according to the law. Sang Sapurba agreed to these conditions, but he requested in turn that the descendants of Demang Labadaun should never move any treasonable practices against his descendants, even though they should become tyrannical. Very well, said Demang Labadaun, but if your descendants break agreements, probably mine will do the same. And these conditions were mutually agreed to, and the parties swore to perform them, imprecating the divine vengeance to turn their authority upside down, who should infringe these agreements, end quote. But I think the solemnness of the contract, the janji, or wa'at, emerges more clearly in the Malay. And I hope the non-Malay speakers will indulge me to read from uh, Abdul Rahman Haji Ismail's romanization of Sir Stamford Raffles' manuscript in order to illustrate my point. Baiklah tuanku, tetapi jikalau anak cucu tuanku dahulu mengubahkan dia, anak cucu patik pun mengubahkan dia. Maka titah Sri Tribuana, that's Sang Sapurba, baiklah kabulah hamba akan wa'at itu. Maka keduanya pun bersumpah-sumpahlah barang siapa mengumpah perjanjiannya itu di balik Allah Subhanahu wa taala bumbungan rumahnya ke bawah kaki tiangnya ke atas itulah sebabnya maka dinugerah akan Allah Subhanahu wa taala kepada segala raja-raja Melayu tiada pernah memberi aib pada segala hamba Melayu jikalau sebagai mana sekalipun besar dosanya tiada diikatnya dan dikandungnya dan difarihatkannya dengan kata yang jahat jikalau ada seorang raja memberi aib itu alamat negeri akan dibinasakan Allah Subhanahu wa taala Syahadan segala hamba Melayu pun dinugerahkan Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala tiada pernah dehaka dan memalingkan mukanya kepada rajanya jikalau jahat sekalipun perkatinya dan aniaya uh, sekalipun. Now the actual nature of these punishments described may seem severe, but the principle of the contract between ruler and ruled is clearly established. A violation of the agreement will not only cause chaos in society, but also divide, uh, invite divine wrath, just as the Tringanu stone indicated. The message of this story is quite different from another story from Malay literature often used to justify authoritarianism, that of Hang Tua, who proffers his absolute loyalty to the Sultan Mansur Shah and is handsomely rewarded for it. The story found in the same Malay annals is that the Sultan has ordered Hang Tua to be executed after being wrongfully accused of having seduced one of the female attendants of the palace. But he was instead hidden by the Bindahara, that's the prime minister figure, owing to his matchless prowess. Later on, Hang Tua's childhood friend and companion, Hang Kasturi, formed a connection with one of the Raja's concubines in the palace, and the only person skilled enough to carry out the punishment of death was Hang Tua. The Sultan expresses his regret at having executed him, at which point the Bindahara reveals his continued existence. The Sultan pardons him and orders him to kill Hang Kasturi. He does so and is greatly rewarded in rank and title. 
But the version of the story still romanticized in Malay popular culture is based on the Hikayat Hang Tua. Here, after the Sultan orders the execution of Hang Tua on false charges, his friend and companion Hang Jebat avenges the wrongful punishment by leading a rebellion, causing chaos in the palace. After discovering that Hang Tua was not indeed executed, the Sultan orders him to kill Hang Jebat for rebelling and he does so, resulting in the same personal advancements. This story thus produces a more explicit example of unquestionable loyalty to authority. However, in recent years, the idea that Hang Jebat is the real hero standing up to unjust leaders has been actively promoted as well. Whichever version contains the greater truth, the legend of Hang Tua belies the proto-constitution that is supposed to have governed the polity he was living in, namely the Sultanate of Malacca. Today's champions of the Undang Undang Malacca are likely to praise its religious content, typically to justify the supposed reintroduction of statutes now. But a close reading of the text reveals an understanding of legal, economic, and philosophical concepts that were about to be expounded in Enlightenment Europe. The text dated to 1656 declares itself as the supreme law of the land. Ini suatu risalah besar pada menyatakan hukum kanun iaitu, iaitu segala negeri yang besar-besar dan pada segala raja-raja yang besar-besar dan pada adatnya yang takluknya dan dusun supaya manfaat atas negeri dan raja dan menteri akan memeliharakan segala rakyatnya. It establishes the rule of law even over rulers. It then describes the roles of principal office bearers of state, the Bandahara, the Temunggong and Shah Bandar, akin to a constitutional separation of power powers. And several articles point to the importance of property rights and the existence of a capitalist economy. Article 11 establishes that a thief can be lawfully killed on a second offence. Article 20 declares that there are two types of land, dead or living, and suggests that dead land may be acquired by working on it, harking to the labour theory of property rights that John Locke would have recognised. Jikalau diperbuat kampung atau rumah atau huma tanah itu dalam perkataan orang lagi dapat didakwa orang kerana tanah itu tanah hidup. It goes on to specify punishments for trespassing on such land. Article 23 states if the kingdom is met with famine then emergency clauses are activated enabling peasants to find food. Article 29 refers to standardized weights and measures the violation of which the Shah Bandar will punish. Article 30 governing the legitimacy of transactions between two parties is quite remarkable. Tiada sah berniaga bagi orang gila dan tiada sah berniaga dengan kanak-kanak yang belum balik. Dan tiada sah berniaga, melainkan dengan kata orang berjual juga seperti katanya, ku jual benda ini, mana, maka kata yang membeli, ku beli benda ini. Dan harga benda itu hendak bertuntu. This establishes that for a sale to be valid, the parties must be adults of sound mind who must explicitly agree to buy and sell the item at an agreed price, all concepts crucial to contract law today. It goes on to regulate the use of proxies, punishments, misrepresentation, establishes a statutory return policy and forbids barter. This was strictly a cash economy. The subsequent clauses govern the sale of houses, land, transacting while in debt, bankruptcy, investments and trusts. And this to me provides a clear evidence that the Malay state undertook responsibilities to protect the individual rights of its members and not merely to uphold the prestige of the group which forms the battle cry for so many conservatives today. But it wasn't just in Malacca that these provisions occur. Similar articles appear in contemporaneous codes in nearby kingdoms. For example, the 1650 laws of Kedah also describe the responsibilities of defined office holders and the use of certain weights and measures. But legal innovations continued to occur independently across the sovereign Malay kingdoms too. One economic example is Johor's Kang Chu system, in which the increasingly powerful Temunggung, dying Ibrahim, began the practice of issuing surat sungai from, or river letters, from 1844 to 1862. And these granted leases to planters to cultivate the riverbanks. Armed with this authority, the Kang Chu, or river lord, uh, essentially performed the functions of government and paid taxes to, to, to the Temenggung. Under Temenggung, later Sultan Abu Bakar, 
the system became more structured with different types of surat issued to specify the terms of contracts and the responsibilities of the Kang Chu. Now, most commentary on this system, including in Malaysian school textbooks, characterizes this policy in racial terms, a Malay policy inviting foreign Chinese investment. But in policy terms, this is strikingly similar to more recent innovations, such as special economic zones or growth corridors. Next door in Negri Sembilan, an ancient socio-political system called Adat Prapateh, also uh, originally derived from the uh, Minangkaba region of Sumatra, maintained institutions distinct compared to other states. Indeed, up until today, the continued exist, uh, existence of the ruling chiefs, the Undangs, each heading districts known as Luaks, and each according to matrilineally determined clan membership, continues to fascinate Malaysians. A former British resident of Negri Sembilan, R.J. Wilkinson, wrote in 1914 that, and I quote, if any European student imagines that constitutional government is alien to the Asiatic mind, he may study the Minangkaba system with profit, for it is a genuine Malay creation and owes nothing to alien influence. Its faults and failures are those common to all democracies, overmuch disputation, irre irresolute and divided action, and the inertia that comes of a government being overweighted with checks and counterchecks. These faults were free from any oriental hankering after despotism. The Negri Sembilan Malay was a loyalist in his way, but he loved his liberty even more than he loved a lord. The king, or young Dipatuan Besar, was essentially a constitutional ruler." End quote. Another Orientalist and colonial administrator, R. O. Winstead, opined that the Negri Sembilan constitution developed on similar lines as the British constitution. And local historians, too, have written much about the democratic, decentralized, and matrilineal aspects of Adat Prapati. At least two key concepts innate to Negri Sembilan, Adat, have been adapted to serve present-day Malaysia, an elected monarch and the concept of federation itself. Of course, today in Malaysia, just as in so many Muslim countries around the world, the structure of government and the incentives of leaders seem a world apart from the historical backdrop I have alluded to. But when we consider that so much experimentation and development occurred in these explicitly Muslim polities, it does provide an alternative to the authoritarian mode of those who say that they strive to make society supposedly more Islamic. At Ideas, we try to show that the framers of the Constitution acknowledged both the narrative of Malay Muslim institutional development and the democratic parlance of the day, particularly in the Cold War context in which Malaya received independence. They appreciated the difficulties of governing a plural society and sought to embed mechanisms to mitigate potential conflict. Today, Malaysians disagree vehemently with each other on what the constitution actually means. And these are divisions that could lead to violent consequences. To me, the only sustainable solution lies in young Malaysians. And achieving that is a topic of an entirely different conference. But when reference is made to a supposed social contract between various races as a basis for our country, Malaysians should be able to respond with the actual social contract signed between Sang Saporba and Demang Lebar Dawan. When there is appropriation and abuse of power by the executive, Malaysians should be able to cite the Tranganu inscription stone to demonstrate that such abuses should be severely punished. When theocratic solutions are offered to our problems, Malaysians should be able to explain the development of an advanced secular law within our greatest Muslim polity in the 15th century. When there is too much interference in the economy, Malaysians should be able to cite the Undang Undang Malacca where transactions were only valid on certain conditions. When foreign investors are seen to be intervening in our domestic politics, Malaysians should be able to cite the lessons learned from the policies of the Sultanate of Malacca and the Kang Chu system. And when the federal government seeks to unduly appropriate power from states, Malaysians should be able to point to the long history of decentralization and federalism that began in Negri Sembilan. Without a renewed national consensus of the underlying principles of our nation, involving all parties and a cross-section of citizens, these centuries-old roots of a democratic society may be poisoned and eradicated. I hope that conferences such as this one will help equip all of us with the sun, water, and fertilizer that we can apply in our respective countries. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.